What's up, family? Darius Daniels, do not fast forward this. <laughs> I know you, I know you, I know you. I'm getting right to this word, but please don't do me like that. Don't fast. I got two quick things I want to share with you, and I want to let you get right into this message. You're going to enjoy this message. I pray you do. It's from a series I'm doing at our church called, listen to this, Put People in Their Place. So you're going to be blessed in a minute, but listen, two things really quickly. I just need like 45 seconds. The first is this. If you're watching this before January 19th, 2020, I want you to join me for Change Night ATL. What's that? It's when I come to a city, I bring our worship team with us, and we bring a night of transformation to the people in that city. The address is on the screen. If you're anywhere in the Atlanta area, or if you know someone, would you please do me a favor? It's all I'm asking of you. Spread the word because we want to help as many people as possible. That's it. The second thing, don't fast forward it. I know you. Second thing I'm excited to announce is I got a brand new book that's being released January the 28th, 2020. So if you're watching this before January 28th, 2020, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to my website, DariusDanielsRQ.com, and I want you to pre-order this book. I'm going to tell you why I want you to pre-order it, because I did a sit-down e-course where I taught the principles of this book, Relational Intelligence. It's the people skills you need for the life of purpose that you want. People in your life have a place, and you got to put the right people in the right place. Your purpose demands it, your peace requires it, and your productivity will be blessed because of it. I'm telling you, this book about relationships the content changed my life. I believe it's going to change yours. Now, if you're watching this video after the book is released, you can go anywhere books are sold. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and you can get this book. But I'm telling you, this is a resource I believe is going to change your life. Speaking of relationships, enjoy this message. Put people in their place. I believe this series is going to help position us for it. It's called Put People in Their Place. And so Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 20, says, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to one another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it was written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. The subject is a question. The question comes from verse 20, which says Jesus is reclining at the table. Here it is, family. Who's at your table? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. It's the first Sunday of the year, and I think we need to talk. We need to have a dialogue about your destiny. We need to have a pep talk about your purpose. We need to have a critical conversation about the single greatest contributor to you living a flourishing, fulfilling, and fruitful life. We need to talk about your relationships. We need to talk about your relationships because this is an essential area that most people underestimate. They are unaware of the implications of who they have in their life and who they allow to have influence over their life. They are oblivious to the reality that their spiritual, emotional, professional, and financial well-being is impacted by who is in their life. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 20. Proverbs is a, 
a book of the Bible situated in a section of the Bible called wisdom literature. It's a literature that God wants to use to make us wise because it's possible to live righteous and not live well. Walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. Solomon is saying, he wrote this proverb, we evolve into who we are around. He says in another place in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. In other words, family, there are no neutral relationships, no casual relationships. They either push us forward or pull us backward. They push us into purpose or push us into pain. They bring us joy or they bring us sorrow. People are sent from God or sent by the devil So we must not only evaluate who comes into our life, we must also ask ourselves, who sent them? Were they sent by God for my advancement and my development, or were they sent by the adversary to be a distraction that ultimately leads to my destruction? Relationships matter. A friend of mine once said this, I never forgot it. There's no such thing as a neutral relationship. Mm -hmm. It may feel neutral, <laughs> but it's not neutral. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a neutral relationship. Our relationships either move us forward or they move us backward. They are helping us, they are hurting us. Mm -hmm. They are getting us closer to God's plan and purpose for us, or they're moving us further away. Now, this is what's scary about this. Uh, there's a scripture that says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Oh. So here's the thought. The, the, the thought he leads with is don't be misled, which means it's possible mm -hmm. to be unaware mm -hmm. of the impact that a relationship is having on you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this is I mean, we'll, a little bit later, we're going to talk about assessment, because in the book, we give some tools on how to actually assess the impact that relationships ha are having on you. And, and, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. But one of those is being able to ask yourself non-judgmental feeling questions mm -hmm. about how do I really feel when I interact with this people, with this person? Mm -hmm. You know, especially when you're a person of faith, sometimes. We're so busy filtering our feelings. We don't feel our feelings. Hmm. We're asking, should I feel this way? Or it's wrong for me to feel this way? Or is this judgmental? When the truth of the matter is our emotions, our emotions are messengers. They're the equivalent of a check engine light on a car. It's telling you like, hey, you need to pay attention to this. They matter. They matter. God would not have invented them if they did not matter. When God created the human species, you and me, he created us to be relational. As long as I've got King Jesus, I don't need anybody else. Great song. I know the intent of the heart. It means very well. Great song, not great theology. We need other people. That's not what the, the song is. It's saying we don't need other people. I get the point of the song. But I think at times we can, under, we can be so bruised and burned by betrayal. We adopt an attitude that suggests I don't need what God designed me to operate with. Relationships. Are you here, family? Somebody say relationships, relationships. Matter. matter. They matter, family. God created them. When he created the human species, Adam, he looked at his creation, evaluated the creation, and said, it's not good that man be alone. Here's the trip, y'all. He wasn't alone. Animals were there. 
So the fact that he said, I need to create another aspect of the human species, the female, is God recognizing that Adam needed more than company. He needed someone to compliment him so he could carry out the calling that God had for the human species. So the creation of the woman was not God's intention just to give a man a wife. The creation of the woman was God's intention to give humanity females. He's saying that the human species can't do what I called it to do with just one gender. I need the female gender because she is a helper. She adds value. When she walks in the room and she's functioning in purpose, it's addition, not subtraction. It's multiplication, not division. Is there any sister in the room that can holler at your boy if you add value? If you know when I walk in the room, help just showed up. Are you here? This is why it's important for people to have the spiritual life right. Because then you get your sense of identity from your creator and not from culture. And so you're not struggling with issues about whether or not I have the right curves and what's my weight and and what's my checking account looks like. And am I too old? I'm older now and I'll have a ring on my finger. Listen, it's better to be single and lonely than married and miserable. Let me find somebody over here that will talk back to me I'm telling you right now God sends people to help us carry out our calling relationship therefore relationship management is life management because relationships are purpose partners And I believe the the ability to manage relationships is a kingdom life skill. Anyone that is going to experience God's best, live life the king's way, anybody that's going to experience more has to master the life skill of relationship management. Now, remember, relationships are about pursuing our calling, not just company. So when I talk about relationship management, I'm not talking about pain avoidance. You know, if I say put people in their place, some people are like, that's right, because people messy and people sometimes and they'll have your business on Facebook. That's right, pastor. You tell a pastor. <laughs> I'm not talking about the avoidance of pain. I'm talking about the pursuit of purpose. You got me? I'm saying the right people need to be in the right place, not not so that bad things won't happen. The right people need to be in the right place so that good things can happen. See the difference? Right? So that if, if I am pouring my life into someone, I'm pouring my life into somebody that's a sponge and not a rock. Come on. Because whenever you make a decision to invest your life into somebody, you are investing an irreplaceable asset. You can't get back. And that's time. You will never be as young as you are right now. Y'all aren't talking to me. This is as young as you will ever be. And each day you spend time on something, you are spending something you cannot get back. And if you're going to make investments into people, it is important to know if they're a sponge or a rock. If you're going to submit yourself to be mentored and coached by someone, you want to make sure they have more than an anointing. You want to make sure they have a mantle. What's the difference? An anointing empowers them to do it. A mantle empowers them to teach it. Just because they can do it for themselves doesn't mean they can or want to teach you. Because some people have great gifts, big gifts, but small hearts. And if their heart is small, they're so intimidated by your potential, they won't share what they know. It's one thing for them to know it. It's another thing for them to be willing to share it. And sometimes, are you hearing me? And so a mentor has to have more than a big gift. A mentor has to have a big heart and be willing to share with you what they know and what they've learned and not be intimidated by your advancement. 
some of you are wanting to be mentored by people who don't want you to win. And that's why they are not exposing you to the information. That's why when you're asking them to help, they are not helping. Because they need more than big gifts, they need big hearts. And when you submit yourself to someone with a big gift and a small heart, you are making an appointment for abuse and exploitation. I need relational intelligence because intelligence doesn't transfer areas. I can be competent in an area to make resources, but not intelligent to manage them. I can be competent in my job, but bad at relationships. I need relational intelligence. What is that, Pastor Darius? Relational intelligence is the ability to define and align your relationships. Relational intelligence is the ability to define and align your relationships. Pastor Darius, what, what does that mean? Are y'all ready for this? Come on, this is the 1130. Y'all lit now. Come on. This is the lit crowd. I said, are y'all ready for this? Just because you call them something, don't make them that. This, y'all the real side over here, okay? <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Just because you call them something, don't make them that. We... <laughs> We need to define and align our relationships. I'm defining not to judge. I'm defining to align. I'm defining so I know where to, where to put you, so I know what to expect of you. Right? So if I know you're a taker, I know not to treat you like a friend. Does that make sense? <laughs> it, 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 because... If you're a taker and I treat you like a friend, with a friend, I'm expe expecting reciprocity. But if I know that's not in you, I'm not going to judge you. I'm just not going to give you more than I can stand to lose. So when you call my line, if it ain't in me, I'm going to say, that ain't in me today. I got a headache. I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm ready to take a nap. Not today. It's the... <laughs> Not today. It's the ability to define and align our relationships. Because when I look at the way Jesus managed his, he's the prototype for how to do life the best way, right? The king's way, that's the prototype. When I look at the way he managed his, this is what I see in Jesus' relationship management. He's the model. He's the epitome. He's the example of relational intelligence. This is what it is. Jesus' Jesus' life teaches us this. Everyone is to be loved biblically, valued equally, but treated differently. Love biblically, that means I'm going to love you without conditions. Your age, your race, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your educational level has no bearing on whether or not you should get love. Valued equally, your age, your race, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your educational level, uh, none of that should determine if you are more valuable in the eyes of God. But treat it differently because treating everybody right does not mean you treat everybody the same. Jesus had 12 disciples, apostles, apprentices, mentees, but he treated three of them different than the rest. He treated all of them right, but he didn't treat all of them the same. There were three of them that historians called the inner circle. That's what they were called, the inner circle. They were Peter, James, and John. And so there were some places Jesus went, he took the inner circle, he didn't take everybody. And watch this, he took the inner circle and then didn't give an explanation. Because when you have relational intelligence, you release yourself from the obligation to explain to everybody why they don't meet the criteria to have access to a certain place in your life. When you get relational intelligence, sometimes I can't make it is enough. When Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he didn't take all of the 12. He took Peter, James, and John. When he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't take all of the 12. He took Peter, James, and John. When he was at his height, he took Peter, James, and John. When he was at his lowest, he took Peter, James, and John. Because people that are in your inner circle are people that can handle you when you are at your best. And they can also handle you when you are at your worst. Everybody gets love, everybody doesn't get access. 
Why, why, Pastor Darius? Here's another. I know I may be shaking your theological tree a little bit. Although everyone is equally valuable, everyone does not add equal value to you. I'm not saying treat people like commodity. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying throw away people that you deem to be useless. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying everyone doesn't add the same level of value to your life. There are some people that are in your relational orbit. If y'all are no longer in relationship with each other, nothing really is affected. But there are some relationships, if something happens relationally, your life is impacted in a different kind of way. See, there are some people that are uh, hard to replace. Woo! And those people that are hard to replace are expressions of favor from God. I'm not going to bother this because this is, this is not that kind of series, but I do have to throw it in there for your mind one time. Here it is. That's why the Bible says, whoever finds a wife... <laughs> finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Woo, a wife is favor on two legs. You look at that and say, look at the favor of God. God, you gave me that. Oh, you must love me. Come on, I need somebody to talk to me. I want the made men at Change Church when your wife walk in the room to say, favor, 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 favor. Because when you get something that's unique, that it'll take you your whole life to replace if you can find it. Do you understand that? How hard it is to, to have people in your life who genuinely love you with a self-sacrificial love, who really want you to win, who are loyal, who are supportive, who are rider? Do you know how rare that is? But if we don't live with relational intelligence, it's not that we will um, harm those people or be dishonorable or disrespectful to those people. But without relational intelligence, the people that mean the most to you will get the least from you. Because relational intelligence is living with intentionality. Okay, can I give you all an example? Huh? All right, here it is right here. Um, in 2 Samuel, I think it's chapter 9. That's what I want, right? Who was here at the 9 o'clock? Help me. I'm getting old. Some, yes, 2 Samuel 19. 2 Samuel chapter 19. All right, here it is, 2 Samuel 19. My man, yeah, get him a seat by his, uh, you invited him, right? Yeah, get him a seat right here by her with the eagle's cap. Y'all figure it out. That's my man right there. Uh, when I get through with these weights, I'm going to be like him on y'all. I'm trying to get swole. <laughs> huh? Vanity, all vanity. I don't have pure motives. When I walk in the room, I want my wife to say, favor, favor, favor. <laughs> ah, pray for me right now. I'm back. I'm better. <laughs> There's a man named David who was spiritually passionate, but he didn't live with relational intelligence. When you look at what disrupted the fruitfulness of David's life, it was all relationships. Think about it. Absalom, like, just think about all of that. Amnon, Tamar, all of that. Relationships. One time the Bible says one of his military advisors, his friend, we're going to talk about that next week, because friends have these kind of conversations with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they've, earned enough, they've earned enough relational equity with you that you trust them enough to have the hard conversations because you know because they've proven they have your best interest at heart, right? See, some people try to spend what they hadn't earned with you. It's like, we don't have enough history for you to talk to me like that. I don't know your mo- okay. Verse 5 says, then Joab went to the house 
to the king and said, today you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. Listen to what it says in verse 6. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. Can I tell y'all what's happening here? You had, David had a group of men that are literally fighting and risking their life to save his because his life is in jeopardy by a son named Absalom who's trying to kill him. But David so wants people who have blood to act like family. I'm going to say it again. He wants people who have his same blood to act like family. That he is missing out on the people who don't have his blood that are treating him like family. Do y'all see this? And he said, listen, he said, the people that love you the most, he says, you treat them the worst. And he says, you're running behind people who have already come to a conclusion about you. You can't change Absalom's mind about you, but you're ignoring people who already see you for who you are. That, that wasn't intentional on David's part, but that can happen without intentionality. And I think all of us at some point or another are guilty of that. Taking people for granted. Not intentional, but I think, I think we all be like, man, people like that don't come around. Make sense? So this is an area we want to improve. I know I do. And Jesus gives us a blueprint on how to do it because Jesus is the model of what it means to live with relational intelligence. And here in uh, our foundational text, text, Jesus is sitting at this table. I love this because the Bible, there's a Jesus in Christian's head and then there's a Jesus of the Bible. And sometimes those things, they don't match because we just like think Jesus is sitting, his legs crossed and he's always praying. They at the dinner table, Jesus is reclining at the table. He chilling. And while they were eating, just everybody's eating out of the blue. This is so gangster, out of the blue. They eating. Oh, this is some good. You like this? Y'all like this. One of y'all going to betray me. No warning, no nothing. Somebody at the table. So the disciples start asking, okay, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Now, remember, three ways you can live your life, church's way, culture's way, king's way. In the church's way and culture's way, the response will be something like this. They know who they are. I'm not going to say anything. They know who they are. God knows who they are. Jesus is built different. they like, who is it? Jesus is like the one whose hand is in the bowl with me right now, Judas. I want you to know, I know. Jesus knew this, I believe, not just because he could see with his spiritual eyes. He knew this because he could also see with his natural eyes. He saw signs he didn't judge, but he didn't ignore. He's like, yeah, I believe you're going to be the one that betrayed me because earlier when we were together and we was at this house and this woman had an alabaster box with expensive ointment and she broke it and came and put it on my feet and started washing my feet with her hair. Everybody was complimentary and supportive, but you were sitting over there in the corner sucking your teeth. Talking, talking about we could have taken that and we could have given that to the poor. And he's like, I didn't judge that, but I remembered. I remembered, and now I've been with you long enough to see what has always been in you, so I'm hurt but not surprised. Because I saw this in you. And you were probably upset with me, Judas, when I took Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration and I didn't take you, but you didn't know I saw this in you. And you were probably upset when I took them to the Garden of Gethsemane and I didn't take you, but you didn't know I saw this in you, Judas. So, Judas, you know what? Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Meaning, I know that you have already made up your mind that you're going to be who you are. So, I know... I know that I'm getting ready to wash your feet and you're going to leave here 
after I wash your feet and betray me because I recognize my goodness will not change your character. No matter how much I wash your feet, when you determine to be who you are, there is nothing I can do to change your mind about a decision you made about your character. And some of us keep washing people's feet because if you, you think if I'm so good to them, then maybe they'll be good to me. Their goodness is not based on your character. Their goodness is based on their character. I'm setting somebody free. I hope the Holy Spirit is setting someone free here. Because some of you are looking back, could I have done more? Should I, I should have done more. I, I wasn't enough. And he said if I would have did more. And she said if I would have did more. There's not enough foot washing in the world to make Judas not Judas. When somebody is a taker, giving ain't in them. So, uh, so you just know how to position you see that? Say said, whatever you do, do it quickly. I'm not going to delay the inevitable. He didn't remove him from the table. See, some of us, we petty like that. We're like, and don't be sitting here in my food either. Somebody take his plate. I know what you get ready to do. Sit up here eating with me like I don't know. I know. <laughs> Where's my real? They not, they, I lost the realness. Somebody give me my food. Give me my food. <laughs> Give me my food. Here it is, family. Judas wasn't the only imperfect personality Jesus had to manage. When you're doing relation, when, when there's relational intelligence, you're managing imperfect people. So there has to be a non-judgmental awareness. I'm aware but not judging so that I know where to put you. Favor, 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 favor. <laughs> favor, 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 favor. What was I preaching about? Somebody, huh? Non-judgmental, non, non-judgmental awareness. Right? So here it is. Because watch this. You know who else is at Jesus' table? Thomas. Who's Thomas? That's the supportive skeptic. The doubter, right? He was doubt Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection, for those who may not be familiar with that part of the story. He was like, unless I see the holes in his hand, in his feet, in his side, I don't believe it. Thomas is that supportive skeptic. That's your friend. They supportive and skeptical at the same time. You don't think about starting a business for real? Well, girl, you can do it, I think. I don't know. I'm praying for you. <laughs> go ahead. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, but you, you go ahead. You don't judge them. You just know you, that's not your first call when you're dreaming. When you're struggling with a dream, you don't call somebody who's going to help you struggle. You, you, you got James and John. They were at his table. They were competitors. They went to Jesus one time and said, Jesus, listen. Now, when you get to your throne, I know it's 12 of us. It's not, it's not going to be that many chairs up there. <laughs> but I know you're going to have one on your right hand and one on the left. It's two of us, me and James. Don't tell Peter because you know how you get with them swords in people's ears and stuff like that. I don't want no drama. I'm not trying to be messy. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I, listen, listen, we just want to sit on your right hand and on your left. They're competitors. They wanted to, to feel like they had a relationship with Jesus that was unique from the other 12. It wasn't enough for them to be in the 12. They wanted to be different from the 12. And they were already in the inner circle. That was different. And Jesus had already given them a name. They were called the Sons of Thunder. But when people are needy, enough is never enough. See, they represent good pit friends. They just draining. Is that all right? 
It's just like, ooh, they're a nice person. They just drain me, though. Okay, there was somebody else at the table, Nathaniel. Nathaniel was, Jesus saw Nathaniel. He said, behold, one in Israel in whom there's no guile, no cap. He just, he's, he's just honest. He's the blunt buddy. Not that kind of blunt. <laughs> somebody was like, blunt buddy? That's in the box? What's his number? I'm trying to see something real quick. I'm trying to see something. Let me see. Let me see some. Oh, no, that's the person that's truthful but not tactful. It's the friend that says anything in front of anyone. You're like, listen, you can't say that. <laughs> Pete, Peter was at, the, at that table. Peter represents the temperamental team member. I'm with you for life. Be for life. On life, I'm with you. <laughs> On life, I'm with you. For life, I'm with you. BFFs. Best friends forever. You know Jesus? I don't know him. You know Jesus? I told you I don't know him. You know Jesus? I told you don't ask me anymore. I don't know him. One moment, he's like super spiritual and performing exorcisms. Then the next moment, he's taking out a sword and cutting all people's ears. He's the one that's hard to live with, but you can't live without. Right? <laughs> he's the one. He cutting out people's ears. You, you taking the ear, putting it back on the person saying, Peter, I can't believe you did that. But you ride for me like that, though. You know this is so wrong, but you my man. <laughs> you shouldn't have did that, but he had it coming, didn't he? I'm so <laughs> Here's the person. You going in a certain room. You pull up in the parking lot. You put the car in park. You look over at Peter. You take a deep breath. <sighs> now listen. <laughs> we getting ready to go in here. Peter, please. I don't feel like fighting tonight. I don't feel. I lost them. They're not real. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel like fighting tonight. I don't. I'm just, I'm just trying to have a good time. <laughs> don't embarrass me. Please. Judas is at that table. Judas, Judas, is, the, Judas is the blind betrayer. He betrays and he's blind. Y'all missed that, didn't you? So he hurt you, but he feel like the victim. He hurt you, he feeling like the victim. He mad at you, should be mad. He mad at you. <laughs> you betrayed me, but I'm wrong. It's the one that can see everybody else but them. All of them are at the table. And Jesus had to manage all of them differently. He treated all of them right, but he didn't treat them the same. Because you got to know where to put them. You see that? You understand what I'm saying? So you got to know who to, who to put where, where to, who to take where. Knowing the tree, not judging it, but knowing it by the fruit that it bears. And this is something people have to get right. Because if not, you'll waste time investing in um, people who you think are sponges, but they're rocks. If not, you'll neglect real friends hanging with associates. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you the difference in this series. Um, if not, you will miss out on acceleration in your life because you'll, you have to keep learning everything by experience. Experience is the most effective teacher, but it is also the most expensive one. Because it costs you time. See, because see, the mistake costs you time when you got to clean it up. Have you ever heard something in church or a podcast or YouTube? You ever learned a principle and you're like, 
I needed that five years ago. Why? Because not knowing that cost me five years. Sometimes some mistakes cost you more than that because of the cleanup you have to do. So when you learn everything by experience, your life is not a, is not a progression where you're, uh, it's not a, not a consistent season of progressions. It's seasons of starting over and cleaning up. So it's this cycle of I'm always fixing stuff from the last season and not advancing. And God knows, or God wants us to know, I'm done, that he's not just a need meter. He's a need assessor. What's that mean, pastor? He assesses our, he knows what we need even if we don't. And this is what's scary about relational intelligence. Most people don't know they need to improve it. Because they think as long as they're not in pain, they're doing a good job. But relational intelligence isn't just about managing pain. It's about pursuing purpose. God wants to increase our awareness. And there are three things that need to happen. Number one, we need to open our eyes. Jesus didn't ignore what he didn't judge what he saw, but he didn't ignore it. And if our eyes are open, we'll see patterns. Not judge issues, but just know what issues can assassinate me if I don't manage it right. Number two, we need God to open our heart. Because the Holy Spirit is our sixth sense. I'm not saying everything we feel is God, but some things we feel are God. And there are times that sixth sense is telling you, don't tell them that. Don't share that with them. That's too soon. Don't do that. And when we ignore that, it can cost us. May God open our heart. And last but not least, may God open our ears. The Bible says the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And no one is perfect. Even people who love you well need some work. And there are times where people's mouth is telling off on their heart, and they don't. the heart is deceptive. God knows our heart. We don't always know it. So if you listen carefully, sometimes you can see, uh, that sounds like a little, I think that's my, that's my best friend, but I think, I think they're competitive. If your ears are open, you can hear that. You say, you know, every time I talk about me, we don't keep talking about me. We start, we start talking about them. See, if your ears don't open, you, you won't pay attention to that. And that doesn't mean they're a bad person. That doesn't mean that they're evil. It may mean that when they grow up, grew up, they didn't get the emotional affirmation needs met. So they're in adulthood with insecurity, and the insecurity is playing itself out with competitiveness. So it means that you don't judge their jealousy. You just love them enough to stop triggering it. You know, I know it. He said, you know, I, I realize, I think when I start talking about what God is doing in me and through me and for me, it triggers something in them. So even though they, I love me with all of, I love them with all of me, they can't handle all of me yet. Because this isn't just about having good relationships or having good friendships. It's about being one. Because that's part of your purpose. I'm going to talk to you about that next week. Father, I pray for three things. Open our eyes that we can see. Open our heart that we can sense. Open our ears that we could hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Clap your hands on this first Sunday of 2020, everybody. How many excited about this series? Hey, I hope you were blessed by that message. It's a part of a series called Put People in Their Place. I'm going to let you go, but as always, there's one thing I always ask of you. I hope this content is blessing you. I only ask one thing. If this content is adding value to your life, I want you to share it with someone else. Email it, text it. Our mission is to help as many people as possible change their life. And we can't do that without your help. Thank you. I meet so many of you who tell me you share these videos. It means the world to me. 
and I pray it's a great blessing to others. Now, also from time to time, many of you ask, how can we reciprocate, right? How can we sow back into the field that we're harvesting from? We've never asked you for that, but there are times where people ask us how they can do that. Well, if you want to be a blessing to finance, a financial blessing to change church, you can go to lifechange.org and you can do that there and support the work that we're doing through Change Church. Or if you want to sow into Darius Daniels Ministries, which is the teaching ministry God has given me outside the context of our local church, you can go to DariusDaniels.com and do that. We don't pressure you on our end. We do believe in the principle of reciprocity, but we're on this platform because we want to be a greater blessing to you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Take care.